So the first year I taught it, the star was Kelly. She was a sculptor with no engineering background. They did semester projects integrating their skills, and so this is what Kelly did. Hi, I'm Kelly, and this is my screen one. Do you ever find yourself in a situation where you really have to scream, but you can't because you're at work, or you're in the classroom, or you're watching your children, or you're in any number of situations where it's just well? Well, Screen Body is a portable space for screen. When a user screams into Screen Body, their screen is silent. But it is also recorded for later release, where, when, and how the user chooses. Now, you laugh, which is reasonable, but also notice that with no technical background after a few months of a class, she designed a circuit board, found the board, circuit board, stopped the program the microcode, worked with acoustic phones, piezo key sensors. Uh, this was a web browser that lets parrots surf the net and talk to other parrots. Uh, this was an alarm clock you wrestle with and prove that you're awake. Uh, this was a dress instrumented with sensors and spines that defends your personal space. This year after year, these projects uh, happen. Or on the campus of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, outside the media lab where much of the digital revolution was pioneered. And it's here that today, what Neil Gershenfeld believes will be the next revolution in personal empowerment is being explored. Was this, did you make this in the... This, this is an old printed bicycle. Uh, this is uh, basically a complete bicycle made from two-dimensional uh, polycarbonate cut on a water jet cut. This machine, costing hundreds of thousands of dollars, uses an incredibly powerful jet of water to cut through materials ranging from plastic to steel, fabricating in a few moments objects designed on a computer. It's just one of the machines available to students taking a course Gershenfeld teaches called How to Make Almost Anything. If I had one of these machines at home, you could email me this bike. My sister actually was emailed this bicycle in Sydney and she's riding one around. Are you kidding? No, seriously. Isn't that incredible? So wait a minute, so that means that if I order a bike from a company someday, it won't come in a truck. It'll cut all, everybody will have one of these machines, and a lot of what we order, lamps, furniture, bicycles, will get emailed to us, we'll have it a few seconds later. The only thing wrong in what you said is it's not when you order the bicycle, it's when you design the bicycle. <laughs> you design the bicycle. <laughs> okay. Did you recognize what this is? This is actually a model of Matisse's Blue Nude number two. Um, you can see that the leg here, the hind leg, uh, another leg here on the thigh, the arch of the back, uh, the head, and the hand holding the front wheel. So that happened so consistently year after year, I finally got that the students in this class were answering the question I hadn't asked, which is, what is all this stuff good for? If the research is leading to digital fabrication, go back, digital computing, the killer app was personal computing. Ken Olson, head of digital, famously said, you don't need computers in the home. You have computers in the home, deck is bankrupt, but they're not there for inventory and payroll, they're there to talk to friends and listen to music and do all the things you do. In the same sense, the research is leading pretty explicitly to the Star Trek replicator, molecular assembler, but the killer app of digital fabrication is personal fabrication, which means products for market of one person, not prototypes for mass production, but uh, production for a market of exactly one. In turn, there's a very close analogy. If mainframes reach PCs through mini computers, and in the same sense, between the millions of dollars machines on campus and the 20 year research roadmap, we're pretty exactly in the PDP era. This is Kernigan and Ritchie, or Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie at Bell Labs and Ben Unix. And that's the moment when just about everything you do in a computer happens. You don't have to wait 20 years for the iPhone to invent how you're going to use computers. It happened in this magic moment when it became accessible to work groups. 
And that's where we are today, and that led to this giant accident I'm here to tell you about. Search for solutions for the world we share. Principal Voices, in association with Shell. We've had a digital revolution, but we don't need to keep having it. We can declare success we won. What's coming now is the digital revolution in fabrication. My colleagues and I started teaching a class called How to Make Almost Anything. And the idea was just that. It's a program looking at how the digital world relates to the physical world. And one of the core things coming out of the research is the idea of digital fabrication, making the Star Trek replicator an assembler that makes anything you want by building the atoms on up. This is designed to put in millions of dollars of equipment at MIT are like the mainframes of digital fabrication. We can make anything we want using those tools. In 20 years, we'll make it so you can have it in the home. The fab labs are in between. They spread all around the world, letting ordinary people create technology from South Africa to the north of Norway and from rural India to inner city Boston. Instead of spending vast amounts of money to send computers and energy and communication around the world, you can spend much less to send the means to create it. Energy, communication, computation, just to say the words, they sound big. They're being tackled as billion dollar mega projects top down. Fab Labs is tackling them from the bottom up. We're just finding so many people with such interesting inventions and such great ideas. Sharing that is where I see this going. Principal Voices, in association with Shell. So none of that was planned. Um, uh, um, um, when you spend as much of your tax money as I did, the NSF said, <laughs> you have to do social outreach. And usually it's like a website or a class at a local school. And that just didn't sound that exciting. And so we made a deal with our NSF program managers. Rather than talking about it, we'd actually give people the tool. And so we set up this little lab that was kind of in between what we use on campus and what we're going to be in 20 years. Where think of this as one machine broken into a bunch of machines so that you make functional systems. And if there's time, I can tell you all about what goes into it. And we set up one in inner city Boston. And, and that was it. That was the project. Um, but there's a strong Ghanaian connection. So this is a lab went to Sakhandi Takarabi in the coast of Ghana. Then there's a strong South African connection. This is Soshan Gobi, a township outside Pretoria. Uh, this is Pabal in western Maharashtra in India. This is Jalalabad in the eastern part of Afghanistan. You, you just can't wake up in Cambridge, Mass, and decide eastern Afghanistan needs precision fab tools. But every time we opened one, somebody else wanted one. And it wasn't for a digital divide on a computer screen. It was for people who wanted to measure and modify the world around them. There was a uh, viral spread all around the world. Um, and so we didn't have an agenda. Um, but as we started doing this, um, uh, there was a kind of a flow we would see through it. Um, uh, it would start with just empowerment. Uh, these were young kids in inner city Boston who made, did rapid prototyping on a street corner, made a few hundred dollars. It spread to hands-on technical training. So when we set up that lab in Ghana, uh, we designed a network sensor. There was an eight-year-old girl who refused the lab until she could make the network sensor. I am eight years old. I need a statue board. 